Hello everyone and welcome to day 59 of Bitwise, where we go to complete software hardware stack for a simple computer from scratch. Last time we covered pipelining um, and you know using feed forward registers for pipelining via the delay operator. Um, we'll be covering, we'll be doing pipelining subsequently all the time. It's the standard technique for um, for improving throughput. Um, but um, now I want to move to another topic that's core to sequential logic, which is previously we had registers, um, but almost always you want to have various static memories on chip, uh, so-called SRAMs. Uh, in the case of FPGAs, uh, there's a very kind of uh, configurable version of SRAMs called BRAMs for block RAMs. And, um, but in any case, uh, having a notion of a memory um, uh, with some variable number of, of read ports and write ports is uh, is extremely handy, and uh, it kind of deserves to have some level of built-in support in a modern HDL. So we're going to get to that. Um, but before that, I want to show you a model of how you can implement a memory using uh, using registers and all the combinational logic stuff we've we've covered uh, already. Um, and yeah, someone's asking if the timing is different now. I'm in Europe, so um for this month at least until probably second week of september i will uh be doing these during uh the afternoon uh in in sort of central european hours uh and i don't necessarily expect people to be able to catch catch me live but um i'll still be uploading them as as always so people can catch it on their own time uh time zone all right so uh, yeah covering uh covering memories. So uh, remember last time we finished up with a pipeline multiplier and we wrote a test case where we had a two concurrent uh, tasks, one producer and one consumer, and we verified that that worked. Um, so let me start by uh, showing you how you can synthesize memories out of uh, registers and uh, muxes and decoders and stuff like that. And this is more of a model of how you can implement it. And I guess it's sort of, if you squint hard enough, is kind of how memories work um, in on, on, on chips on a low level, but you typically do very kind of high detail, high density transistor level design for that. But this is one way of implementing it if you want to using flip-flops, even though that's normally not done, but it's kind of a model. Um, so let's say we want to build a constructor function uh, which takes a type, which is going to be the the data type, and um, and a size, and uh, basically instantiates a memory that has as many entries as the size dis dictates, and each element of the memory, each word, if you will, is going to be of the specified type. Um, and uh, the way I'm going to do it is I'm just going to have basically this thing is going to return uh, a module um, for each of these. Well, let's see. Um, actually, this this is a good use case for um, something we haven't really done so far, but is kind of ideally suited for this sort of thing, which is using functions rather than classes to define modules, because then we can have parameterized modules where these static parameters, you know, memories can have different geometries depending on the specific memory, um, but they all share the same basic internals. Uh, they're just parameterized differently. So um, let's see if this works. This should work. So each memory, um, first let's do what's called a single read port, single write port, synchronous memory. What this means is you can have one simultaneous read, one concurrent read, and one concurrent write. And they can be concurrent with each other, but you can't do two writes in a given cycle or two writes in a given cycle. So this is, uh, you know, uh, something like this this usual notation um, and so what we want to have is we want to well first off um, we're going to have a bunch of memory cells and each of them is just going to be a register and so we're going to have a bunch of registers one for every um, uh, one for every address so we're just going to instantiate a bunch of these into a big array and um, then we're going to have sort of two, like I said, two two ports, one read port and one write port. And so for the read port, what we're going to do is um, we're going to have, let's see, 
we need a type to hold the address and based on the size um, I think I have a power of two function don't I well it's a useful thing to add in any case um, Do it like that, I think. Um, so let's just assert that we have a power of two. Um, and so that way, when we take the base lock two of this, we can get the address type. So, you know, if, for example, if we have a memory with 256 elements, um, we need uh, eight bits for the address in order to specify what element we're talking about. So this is the address type. And um, so the read address, which is the address for the read port, is going to, you know, be an input of that type. And um, we're just going to say that there's no read enable. This thing is always going to read the latest value. Uh, we, we could add a read enable, but it doesn't really, it's not strictly necessary. In which case, it's always going to read stuff out every cycle. So it might be a little more memory hungry, but um, doesn't. this is just a model, really. We're not going to be using this much going forward. I just want to show you... Uh, behaviorally, or show you one way you could instantiate a memory from, from all the building blocks we've already covered. Um, so there's going to be the read adder, uh, which is an input, and then there's going to be an output, which is the read data. And it's going to correspond to um, whatever cell uh, has the address of the read adder. And so in order to do that, um, we need to do some muxing. Basically, what we have to do is we have size cells, and based on read adder, we have to pick out uh, which of the which of them we're talking about, and so this is a big mux, and I think we already did a manual for mux. Um, let's see. So yeah, we did a manual for mux here, which was just sort of hand instantiated. Let me um, let me uh, let me uh, show you a general way to do a mux um, recursively. So. I'm going to assert that this is a power of two, um, or the length of this array is a power of two. And then uh, we define a recursive procedure, and if there's only one thing, then the mux always yields that. Otherwise, we basically make a distinction based on the most significant bit of the selector, which is just like kind of an address we're selecting. Uh, maybe I could call it adder to make it even more apparent. Um, so we uh, distinguish on the most significant bit, and if that is set, then we want to recursively mux on, um, you know, using the remaining address bits, we want to uh, mux on, so on the high half of that data array. So uh, we, if we cut this in half, uh, we want to go on the, the high part of that array, otherwise we want to go on the the low part. Um, so this is the sort of thing we sh we've seen before. Basically, what we're doing is we're saying, you know, if the most significant of the address, if the most significant bit of the address is set, then uh, it means that the thing we're looking for is in the second half of the array, the upper half of the array. Otherwise, it's in the lower half. So this slicing here is just, you know, cutting this power of two sized array in half uh, and recursively doing the muxing. So, you know, this is just. Uh, cascading a bunch of two to one muxes to produce an n to one mux uh, where n is a power of two. Um, so I think we've already covered this in different cases. This is actually very similar to the whole function to muxes thing. Um, where did we do this? Uh, fun function to mux. It's very similar to this thing we do, do here where we kind of progressively distinguished on the leading bit of some bit vector until we were down to, uh, well, in this case, zero elements. So it's the same sort of deal. Um, so that's a mux, and that's basically how you address an array of things, if you will. Um, and so in order to do a read port, really all we have to do is we have to mux using the read adder between the, uh, the different cells. And so once we have that, we get the output. And note that right now this is a combinational, this is called you know, combinational read port, uh, asynchronous read port or something like that. 
And uh, what that basically means is um, if I ass assert a certain read address, I will get back, you know, after a propagation delay corresponding to the MUX network we're using to find the right cell, we will get back the read data in the same cycle. So it's not something that has a one cycle delay, but if you want to speed it up, of course, you can pipeline it using the delay operator. Um, <clears throat> so um, let's first see if that compiles. Um, memory missing two required arguments. So where is this? Oh, I guess, so this is a good opportunity to add support for this. Point, the, the, the main reason that I originally added support for, um, uh, for being able to have functions that can be decorated with a module decorator is exactly so that you can do these parametric things. And so I kind of put that in anticipating that we would be needing that, but um, uh, hadn't wanted to cover it yet. So I guess I hadn't actually implemented it correctly. Um, so, um, I guess what I should be doing here, let me just think about it. Um, let's see when you, I think when you call, let me think about this. When you call module, when you call the mo module decorator on a function, really you don't want to at that point you don't know yet what values to use for these parameters so you really want what you want to do is rather than kind of immediately instantiating um a module you want to make a generic you want to make like a factory right like you want to make a thing that can make these on demand so i think the way you do that is um uh what i'm looking for even though I hate this word factory, that's kind of what it is in this case, or you can call it constructor if it makes you feel better. Module constructor. Um, and then what we actually want to do is we, we can't really make the module until we know what arguments to provide. Once we know what arguments to provide, then we can forward them to, to this thing here. That's kind of the idea. Um, let's see if that works. I guess on the, maybe we'll make a, a dis, well, um, so where is this coming from? Oh, right, I have to return, make module. Something like that. Um, right, so we, we return a function that then sort of awaits, uh, awaits the actual arguments, and until it has them, it can't really do anything. And I guess we want to actually memorize this. So sort of like templates in C++, um, if you call the same constructor, uh, module constructor function, parameterized constructor function with the same arguments multiple times, you don't want to create a fresh new module class for every instance. So uh, I, I think you want to memorize on these arguments. Um, of course, the, the module class can be instantiated multiple times. I'm talking about different module classes. So, okay, uh, let's see if that, okay, so that at least got us that far. Um, now, let's see if we can instantiate this. Like if I instantiate this with, uh, like I want to say, I want to have um, uh, n bits per thing and I want to have 256. Okay, so um, this is just this was a typo. It actually was invoking this code. So yeah, let's see if that works. Okay, so let's just look in the trusty debugger. 
rattle.memory. You have a bunch of, you see the read address, how wide is it? It's eight bits corresponding to uh, 256 elements. So that's uh, great. Um, so uh, right now it's not very useful. Actually, one thing we should do here as well, which I hadn't really thought about, is, um, let's see, um, read-only memories are actually really useful. Um, and so um, even with just one read port, if it was a read-only memory that is sort of hardwired to have a certain set of, of values for these registers, actually, if it's a read-only memory, you don't really need registers. So actually, let's not add this to this version of it. Um, there's no point in storing things in registers if they're known at, uh, at design time. You should be able to just make a big MUGS network of, of constants, basically. Um, so let's uh, let's add a write port as well. So for the write port, um, again, there is a, an input address. Um, here we do need an enable because, uh, you know, since this has side effects, it's actually important. The thing about not having a read enable is even though it may be slightly wasteful to always be doing the lookup in some sense, especially in terms of power consumption, it's not really, um, you know, it doesn't have a side effect. So it's fine if it just, if the address is sort of whatever thing it is and it'll just give you some data, but as long as you don't expect the data to be anything in particular, it's fine. But for writes, of course, they have side effects. So we do need to have a way to gate writes. Um, so, right. Um, and these are all going to be, there's not going to be any outputs associated with this. So um, it'll be like this. Um, now, what we have to do is we have to uh, hook up the, uh, so in order to do readouts, we basically had to do, we had to mux things. We had to select between which of the registers uh, values to route to the output. Um, for writes, what we're going to do is, um, I think we we haven't added supports for register enables, right? Like we, you, you have to do it manually right now, what I recall. So, okay, we do have enables, but are they actually respected? Don't think they are. Um, so let's avoid those for now. Let's just do manual enables. So basically w what I'm going to do is I'm going to iterate over, um, well, I guess I could actually do this. Uh, for each of the storage cells, Remember, this is a register. So if I didn't say anything for next, it's just going to retain its its uh, it's going to retain its value uh, forever, which is not very interesting. So what you want to say is, um, if the if if writes are enabled and um, the write address equals i. So here, this is not a very efficient. This is not trying to share the so-called decoding logic. Uh, maybe I'll show that in a sec how to do that. Typically, when you do a so-called decoder, which is when you have a binary address, like, for example, an 8-bit address, and you want to turn it into 256-bit uh, bit signals, that is, uh, you know, if, if you assert the, you know, if you have, for example, a 3-bit, well, I don't know, I said 8-bit. So if you have uh, if you have something like this, is that 8 bits? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Well, anyway, let's just say it's 1. Um, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Um, in binary, if this is the uh, the address, then you want the um, the decoded address to be a. Uh, you could think of it as being an array of two fifty six one bit signals, where um, where each you know, logically each thing is basically i equals address uh, for i in range, and so there's n things. Um, so basically, this is just a bunch of logically. It's just a bunch of comparators, but you can share you can share the logic between the nodes so that each of them doesn't independently have to instantiate a whole comparator. They can share the bits. Like for example, if uh, if your address um, four and five, you share the same comparator network except for the least significant bit. So you can share all those AND gates, and then for the last one, you make a distinction. But uh, let's not worry about that now, uh, but just wanted to note that in, in a real so-called decoder, you try to share um, the gates for the different addresses. But uh, here we're just instantiating one, and I guess we're kind of, imp if it's, it, 
it's it's usually a, fine to write it like this. Your synthesis tool will then have to catch it and factor out the common gates. Um, but anyway, um, but anyway, so yeah, basically what this says is. Uh, for each cell, if the write is enabled and the write address equals my address, which is I because I'm enumerating these, then instead of just retaining my old value, I want to take whatever's on the write port uh, and have that become my new value. Otherwise, I retain my old value. So um, if we had um, support for write enable uh, for register enables properly right now it's not hooked up all the way then you would write this um like that and cell next would just be unconditionally connected to write data and then the idea is that um if enable is zero then it retains the old value if enable is one it gets the value from next uh and often flip-flops have this functionality internally and it's also kind of nice to factor it out like this but uh, since that's not supported right now uh, we will write it out manually, same same meaning, um, just fine for our purposes. So anyway, that should be it for a uh, a model of a memory, not how you actually want to uh, for us to use it, but something that will you know be a synthesizable circuit uh, and will actually work hopefully. So let's try this. So um, so how can we test it? Well, we're going to um, we're going to test it as follows. Um, I guess let's make a let's make an example module. Actually, we can just instantiate it directly since it's already a module in its own right. Um, let's call it example fifty three because why not? Just to follow the the convention. So we're going to compile memory, and we're going to compile. Um, I guess let's do 256 elements, and I'll, I'll do 1024. So 10-bit address. Um, let's see if this works. Of course, I'm at bit, not byte. Oop, still running. I want. Okay, I guess it's the 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 problem is. I mean, let's make this smaller. The problem is. This is a pretty big circuit because <laughs> it's whatever 1024 times all this different per cell logic with the mux and the decoder. Um, let's just do this because it should be a little bit faster. I mean, we could make it even smaller. It doesn't really matter how big it is. It's it's, it's going to work or not work uh, one way or the other. So um, now let's make a, a test thing here. And what we're going to do is. Um, uh, so basically, we have the memory, and it's going to be initialized to all zeros, and that's just the default behavior for the registers. So maybe um, let's actually test that. Um, actually, right now, we don't have a great way to interact with combinational circuits. So um, I guess let's just do this. Let's just make these outputs be... Uh, delayed by one cycle so that you know you assert the read address this cycle and the next cycle you can read the result back just so they're consistent but um, anyway let's just do that it's not a big difference but um, um, so anyway so let's first assert that everything is initialized correctly which is kind of a, a simple test but l let's start there um, and so uh, I'm going to um, I'm going to set the read address to I and then I'm going to yield, waiting for the next cycle. And then I'm going to assert that the read data is equal to zero. And so let's just get started there, which is a very simple test. Uh, okay, that works. Now let's try. Um, Okay, this is not a very good hash function. <laughs> or it, I guess it is, but well, anyway. Uh, I was going to try to do some pseudo random stuff um, that's consistent, but um, I mean, we can just try values. So, anyway, having done this, now let's try. Um, I mean, let's say, I don't know, scramble. Um, let's define some weird scrambling function. 
where you take i and you multiply it by a big number. So like Okay. Um Actually, I guess I don't even know if it's probably okay. This is not the same. I guess it actually big integers are hashed differently, so it's just small ones that are passed through verbatim because they're yeah the hash always is fixed size. Eh, let's just say we multiply this by some big number, um, like that beef, uh, and then we reduce it modulo, um, you know, modulo. Uh, 256. I guess in this case, there's really no reason to do the, the whole multiplication. But anyway, let's just do something stupid like that. I just don't want it to be something too simple. If you've ever looked at, uh, you know, memory self-tests, you kind of know that, well, the failure mode is not going to be the same as for the stupid shit. But uh, let's, not, let's use something other than purely sequential numbers. So, okay. So anyway, so now... Um, we have this uh, boot up test, and uh, then I'm going to write some data, and I'm going to uh, just basically scramble i to get some value that we can write that I'm going to yield. So this writes all of those values sequentially, and then I'm going to do a readback, and for the readback, um, I'm going to try to readback everything, and I'm going to assert that the data I get back is what I wrote in. Something like that. I think that should be it. Okay, that didn't work. And that's for the very first element. So we um, we we said yeah we asked for that element and then read data we get back zero so it looked like the oh we didn't set the write enable of course and then we have to set the write enable back to zero when we're done so in every cycle um, while we're doing this loop the write enable is one and then we have to set it back to zero because otherwise it's going to keep essentially writing the same address which in this case, I guess would be benign. Like it would just keep writing the same thing over and over again. Um, but that's not really what we want. Uh, that's not a proper use of it. Uh, so let's see if that works. And it worked. So just a step through it to prove it. So anyway, let's see. For I, we expect that. And I guess that's also what we get if we evaluate this. So yeah, that's um, that's a simple synchronous memory with one read port and one write port. Um, I think you can probably see if you wanted to add more ports, it would be very easy. You would have the same number of cells, but you would just copy this code. Um, well, read ports would be easy. You just literally add more muxes. You'd literally copy and paste this code, but say read one, uh, and so on. You just have to make a new uh, a new interface for each of them. Um, write ports are mostly the same, but there's a little bit of an issue when you use this approach for uh, re write conflicts um, because you can't source from just one of them. You kind of have to, you know, there's different ways you can do it more or less efficiently. Like, for example, um, rather than doing this, you could do um, Hang on, sorry. Um, if you had multiple read port, write ports and they were called write one and write two, the kind of thing you could do is you could write, um, you, you first of all, you still have this logic here, basically. Um, this basic write enable logic is still here. But then if you can guarantee a priori, maybe with an external arbiter, that um, there will never be two writes at the same address concurrently, you can do something like this. Uh, or uh, write one adder equals i and uh, write data or 
write to adder equals i and write data. So basically, this is like what's called a, sometimes called a one hut mux. This is just a mux when you know the different select signals are mutually exclusive. Then you don't have to do a full mux. You could just or them together. You know, equivalently, you could just do like a priority mux where you say um, when And then just sort of have an if else chain. Um, you know, you could do something like this for two ports. But um, rather than having this sort of nested priority logic, you can have a flat one hot mux if you guarantee a priori that the right addresses are never targeting the same thing concurrently. And if they do target it, you essentially would get a, an OR, a bitwise OR of the different things being written. Um, so it's not like it's going to blow up the circuit. It's just going to take the bitwise or of all the different things being concurrently written to the same cell. But anyway, so sc scaling up, the, the the point is that with this kind of design, you can see hopefully how to scale up read ports. That's especially easy for write ports. You have to think a little bit about how to combine the different write ports and the, when they target the same cell. But it, it's not really uh, a hard thing to do there. Um, however, um, I guess, uh, you know, this is not really how you implement memories. Memories are these specialized things. Um, whether you're working on FPGA or an ASIC with a, you know, a third party memory compiler or something like that, you don't want to manually uh, build your memories out of flip flops. Sometimes you have to, but hopefully only when the memories are really small and when the requirements can't be met by whatever standard IP blocks you can you, you have available. Um, but I did want to just show you this to show that you know a memory, a static memory can be built out of flip flops very easily. Um, and in fact one of the advantages of this is that adding read and write ports um, is, is you know you can just do it. It's just logic fully under your control. But um, uh, let's call this my memory or a, a register, let's call this a register memory. Um, so this is basically, you know, this is, A, it describes the behavior of a memory, and it, it describes a possible sort of gate level implementation of a memory, but uh, I'm mostly just heading off with that to say that we're not actually going to be using manually designed memories going forward. Uh, we're going to be offering something like this memory constructor function, but as a built-in primitive in the same way that register is a built-in primitive um, uh, for various reasons. Like one of them, it, it actually helps both. It helps FPGA implementation, ASIC implementation, and simulation because you can, for example, if you're simulating, think about what the simulation is doing right now to support this. Um, because it's executing everything serially, it will basically do all of these checks sequentially, like, should I update this cell? Should I update this cell? And in any given cycle, at most one cell can be updated. It's very inefficient. Um, so you want to implement memories in the software simulator with just plain arrays, just implement it with arrays and reads, write, reads and writes to arrays. And in you know various hardware level implementations, you want to use something that's sort of, you know, FPGA, you want to use BRAMs typically, or maybe distributed RAMs on Xilinx. In, a, in an ASIC, you want to use SRAMs that are compiled with a memory compiler. But in any case, um, it's, it's worth offering a, um, a built-in notion of a memory that can be targeted to those different scenarios. So anyway, that's just to, to motivate why we want to have um, a built-in primitive for that. So uh, let's see, how do we want that to work? Um, let's start with um, um let's see here you can do this in different ways um and i haven't thought a whole lot about how i want to support it in like in terms of the language level implementation stuff but um the way i imagine it working is it has a similar interface to what we had before you specify the data type and the size up front um, And um, I think what you want to do is 
when you instantiate a memory, so if we had something like the, the case we already had, the memory itself comes with no ports. And then, so you, you basically, you specify the, the geometry that specifies the basic, you know, the size of the memory and the, the, the size of each word in that memory. Um, but then from there, I think you want to um, have sort of subsidiary constructor functions that create read ports and write ports. So if I want to have a read port and a write port similar to what we had before, you would basically do something like this, and each of these would instantiate ports. Uh, and and there, you know, these functions can have parameters. Like maybe you can specify the delay um, and stuff like that. Uh, so if you wanted to have a combinational read port, you would do this. Uh, write ports can't be combinational, so the minimum delay is one. But if you wanted to um, have higher performance memories uh, that can do internal pipelining or have output registers or whatever, you could have a higher delay. Um, and then that way, the sort of implementation details are decoupled from the interface. There's a convenient specification interface um, that users can use. And then on the back end, they can be targeted to whatever is available in an efficient manner. So that's kind of the idea. So uh, one call to construct the memory. And this by itself is not a node. This is just a memory description, basically. Um, and then you call these uh, constructor functions to actually construct read ports. When you get these back, then you can do stuff like memory, you know, adder, uh, whatever um, and uh, so so this would be like each of these would basically act like module ports right um, with, with you know for, for a read port for example adder would be the input and data would be the output for a write port uh, it would be all outputs it would be you know enable uh, address and data would all be the inputs so that's kind of what I'm envisioning in terms of the interface um, and so, I guess uh, when you construct one of the one of these guys, uh, boom, 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 boom. it's really just a description. So it just has to have copies of this stuff here. Um, and um, then you can add ports. I guess for now we won't have delay specifications. We can add those as optional arguments later. Uh, but we want to do something like this. And um, hmm. you think about the simplest way to support this. We could just make the modules kind of act like, like each port acts like a module in terms of how it looks to the outside world. We think about whether that's a good idea or more trouble than it's worth. Uh, I'm not sure what that was. Actually, let me just see if someone's at the door. All right, people did get home. Sorry about that. Um, okay, read ports and write ports. Let me think about, if I make the modules, there would have to be sort of pseudo modules that don't really have true internals, um, which is fine, I guess. Um, Let 
This is a little bit awkward to do it this way. Maybe I want to um, it's possible I should be doing something more general because right now the way we're handling the register node, for example, is that it's it looks kind of like a module from the outside in terms of there being these ports like next and enable. Right now, mostly next is the one we're dealing with. Um, and then we need some custom logic for those ports in the linearizer and in other places. And that's a, it seems like a lot of sort of ad hoc junk um, when really for the most part, they just behave like module ports. So maybe, um, it makes me wonder if maybe in both cases we should treat them as sort of pseudo modules that just to most of the system looks like uh, look like um, just another module instance and then they are sort of replaced, compiled away somewhere along the line. But um, you know what, let's not, I'll, I'll keep that sort of in mind uh, for future refactoring, but for now, let's just try to go ahead with the plan design. Sorry, I have to turn on the fan and this fan is super noisy. Actually, that's too noisy. All right. Um, Hmm. So what's the right design for that? There's a memory, and when you um, when you make a read port, you get another instance. Um, and then these have like this data pin here has to act. Can I just make it sort of an anonymous node with the right type? I wonder if that works. Probably does. And we we can't write to that, so we do need an accessor. Um, and then for the address. Uh, something like that. Um, let's see here. Okay. It's going to lead to a ton of annoying code though, which is awkward. Because now all the different visitors have to somehow have a little bit of special handling for, for this stuff. It's not ideal. I think the idea of having a module, like a black box module, as, as the way to represent this stuff is looking more and more attractive. Um, just think about that for a sec. How would that work? That would work a little bit easier if you specify the memory ports up front. Um, but I kind of like this piecemeal construction approach. I mean, you could still have that be the way it works, but then you have to defer the construction of the underlying module until all the ports are known. So you have to probably do lazy construction of the module. So you have to, before you, yeah, that's a little bit awkward. Um, does seem like the right general approach though. <clears throat> you 
you know what, for now, let's just um, have a, a less Swiss Army knife uh, approach to creating ports where you get one read port and one write port by default. So basically it mirrors the interface we had before. And then sort of offline, I will think about the cleanest way to support the, the stuff I, I was originally planning. Um, and so in this case, I think the way you do it is actually going to be very similar to um, what we had before, which is um, you basically you have the interface, and in my case, I'm not going to really, I guess, hook it up to anything. It's just going to be sort of a naked interface with no real internals, and then you can kind of intercept it um, in the back end. Okay, so um, what was the interface we have here? So there's a read adder and uh, So same kind of thing before is that we had a read adder and a write adder. Uh, these are all going to have to be the base two log of the size, and then um, you know, there's. In this case, I think I already support this, but let me just check. Right, you can you can use output with just um, a type, in which case you sort of don't commit to how it's hooked up. That's what we want here. So uh, the output is the data type, and for the um, let's see, uh, write adder, write enable. Right data. Something like that. So let's see. Okay. So this is just kind of like pure interface with no internals. Um, and Let's see what happens if we um, I guess we can't really uh, do that because we can't stand it directly. Let's call it something like this. Then we'll make a separate 43. All right. Uh, Um, right, and then we'll make a separate example 43 that sort of does a similar sort of, well, I guess in this case we'll just wrap this hard-coded memory. Um, so I guess it'll just plummet through or something like that. Um, so what, what were we doing? It was like 8-bit uh, values, right? What was it? 8-bit 64. Um, and I guess I'll just kind of mimic the interface and forward it through. So that's a 4-bit address. Um, 4-bit address. Um, the output is just 
the output from this. Just forward that through. Um, I guess we just plump these through as well. So I, I expect this to explode because, I mean, aside from maybe superficial errors, which don't fix, but um, because <clears throat> yeah, let's try that. Um, because there's really nothing inside the module. Oh, sorry, it's not four. It's, it should be six or 64. Two to the six is 64. Okay, so that works, which means it at least type checks. Um, And so at this point, I guess, um, I think it should even work. Okay. These things should have been moved up a little bit, I suppose. And just rework some of this. Okay. I think I should be able to print it because as long as you're not peeking inside the the sub, you know, the module instance, um, we should be fine and dandy. Uh, boom, boom, boom. Right. I mean, that looks perfectly fine as far as that goes. But of course, when we try to compile it, it's going to explode. But let's just see what happens actually. Might be interesting. It's possible I'm missing some some sanity checks somewhere. So this is example 43, um, and this should explode. Yeah. Um, and actually, let's handle let's uh, let's comment that out so we don't have to run it every time. So what is the default case? None, right? Because I think we're not handling output nodes that are not connected to anything. So this is in the linearizer, I assume, right? Right, it's the linearizer. Okay, let's think about how we want to handle this. Ugh, this is going to get a little bit annoying. But it seems like this is probably going to be useful for supporting other kinds of hard blocks that, that need special handling on the compilation side. Um, I think what you do is this stuff is fine. Um, this is just the normal transformer. I think that's actually fine as well. Um, But yeah, the inliner, you can't really, uh, you can't inline these modules. <sighs> I wonder if this is going to be a good idea or not to do it this way because you can't inline it. So one thing you could do is you can say, once you get to this level, um, certain there are certain a, like abstract modules that don't get inlined. That would be easy enough to support. That's just some conditional code here that 
Um, if you try to inline certain modules, you don't get them inline. They just get passed through as instances the way they were originally. And that would be perfectly fine as far as that goes. Um, and so that would then make it to the linearizer, I suppose. Right, this is the linearizer. At this point, normally there are no modules. So if you encounter a module in the linearizer, it means it was one of the, it must have been, assuming we changed the inliner, it must have been one of these abstract modules that can't get inlined. And so we still have to handle that case here. Um, well, okay, let, let's, let's try going down that path and see if we regret it. Um, So just in order to identify them, let's just make a dummy based less. So we can use that as a tag. Um, and then in the inliner, um, for now, rather than having some general, let's just hard code this, the case with memories, is if the module, well, let's see. This is a generic memory, then we do something different. So what do we have to do exactly? Because we still have to recursively visit, you know, everything. So we, we have to we go look at the transformer. I think we have to do the same sort of thing. So that's probably one way to do it. Um so the superclass is just transformer. So we, I think we can just call the superclass. Um, in which case we, we still get it copied. It's not fully inlined away. Um, probably still have to handle some code here where um, So if we get any further. So now we're dealing with Okay, so this is this is a memory module, and how did we get here? Okay, we got it from there. Takes one positional argument where two were given.
I really have to turn on the fan. Sorry for the noise. I'll try to move a little bit away. It's this obnoxious. It's my mom's fan. She has this tiny fan which has to spin at like the speed of sound in order to move any volume of air. I'm not sure why these fans exist. I wonder if it's something weird with the super class. Um, okay, that's not the issue. So this seemingly works for every other thing. So we don't have access to it here, so Mm. I'm trying to think if I want to rabbit hole too much on this. What are we doing on time? We're already an hour in. Um, you know what? Since this is not really core to the whole issue of memories, let me um, let me back out some of those changes and just actually use our model memory that we implemented from scratch for what I was planning for the rest of this stream. Um, uh, because that's totally, I mean, kind of by intent, it, it, it totally works. Uh, it's just not what we got, what, it, what we want to do eventually. So, but but it still works, and so it illustrates the point that you can build stuff with memories. So let's. Uh, let me figure out offline on, on how I want to sort of structure things like memories and registers. And, and mem memories are particularly complex, but we could even do registers this way if we can find some way of dealing with abstract modules and, and handling them um, appropriately. But um, OK, let's not rabbit hole on that right now. So uh, let's just kill this example and go back to our um, to our original memory. Let's just call this memory. So maybe we'll reuse the interface and we'll just have a more, you know, a hard coded implementation of this. Uh, let's just make sure that still works since we'll be using it. <sighs> All right. Um, seems to work. Just gonna comment this out. Um, anyway, so um, let me show you some things you can implement with memories. I mean, aside from the obvious things, uh, FIFOs. FIFOs are probably the most ubiquitous. Um, like FIFOs occur even more than naked memories in uh, like naked SRAMs in, in chip design, logic design, and so. I thought I would, uh, to finish this stream, now we've talked about memories, I thought I would show you how to implement a FIFO. There's actually different implementation techniques. Um, the one I'm going to illustrate is kind of interesting because it shows how much similarity there is between software and hardware in terms of algorithms and data structures. Because in fact, what is pretty much the implementation of FIFOs in hardware is indeed the very familiar ring buffer FIFO from 
uh, from software where you have, you know, you have a, a little memory. And it, well, in, in software, you have a big memory. You have the RAM for the whole thing, and you allocate a small slice of it, and then you treat it as a ring buffer where the uh, read and write cursors are chasing each other. Uh, in, so in hardware, you typically had a have a specialized memory instantiated just for that FIFO, um, but nevertheless, the implementation principles are the same. And so, um, uh, let, let me show how hopefully simple it is to implement that. Um, and so we're just going to use this memory primitive to make a FIFO primitive. And um, and so let's make it actually, let's make it generic because it's not really going to cost us anything um, to make it generic. And so let's say that we have a FIFO function which makes FIFOs on demand. And the way it works is it has a memory and the memory, in fact, just uses four of these parameters. It has the same size as the FIFO. Um, you know, as before, I guess we can just require that it's a power of two. Uh, in, in any case, the memory will for us if we don't assert it here. Um, and so far, so good. Wait, why is it not? Oh, I guess there's nothing here. All right, whatever. We'll put that in a sec. Um, missing one required element. Oh, it's not memory. It's module. Got memory on the brain. All right. So the basic idea behind a FIFO is there are two interfaces there's the enqueuing interface and the dequeuing interface you know familiar um, the enqueue interface is uh, you know you want to enqueue some data so you specify um, you specify the data you want to enqueue and there's also an enable signal which you know says hey I want to enqueue some data um, and I'll introduce a new element which you haven't covered previously. We've co covered these kind of enable signals and how you can use them to signal that an action you want to, an action to be undertaken. Um, but um, before that, let me just sketch out the more familiar parts. So for dequeuing, um, you get data out, um, but the enable signal is still controlled by you, so that's an input. Um, the thing that is new is back pressure, or you know, here the control signals only come uh, come from the outside. Like I'm the user of the FIFO, I say I want to enqueue some data, but um, if the this is a bounded FIFO, so you have to be able to know when the FIFO is full, you can't enqueue stuff. So there's actually a back pressure signal that goes in the other direction, which is called ready, and this is an output. Um, and similarly for DQ, um, there is a uh, a ready signal, which basically says, you know, can I? Um, this is an output as well, which says, you know, are you allowed to DQ? And basically, what this means is, is the queue non-empty? Because you can only DQ if it's non-empty. So basically, NQ ready means non-full. DQ ready means non-empty. Um, so that's the interface. And so how do you implement this? Well, um, what you do is you have a um, you have two registers like this is just like software with a ring buffer. You have two register uh, registers corresponding to a read address and a write address. Um, so I guess you can write here. Um, C log two size. And they both start at zero, so we don't have to override their initial value. Um, and the two conditions um, for full and empty are the following. Something is empty if read address equals write address, and something is full if read address, so so here's a classic uh, a classic I guess a classic issue 
whatever you want to call it, classic thing with um, with ring buffer FIFOs is, and, and there's various ways of resolving it. Here I'm going to use what I think is the simplest, um, where um, if you let if, if you let the right cursor wrap around and fully catch up to the read address, even though that makes sense from the point of view of filling the whole buffer with, with data, so the buffer is full, you can now no longer determine whether it's full or empty just based on the read and write addresses because they're now coincident for both cases, both empty and full. The easiest way to resolve that, even though it leaves one element in the FIFO wasted, is to, uh, even though the underlying memory has a size power of two, you intentionally never let the right uh, address catch up to the read cursor and so you have this uh, condition which is that the cursor um, the, the FIFO is full if the right address is one one element behind the read cursor so that means the last element of the FIFO is never going to be able to full up fill up um, but it creates a simpler um, a simpler condition for, 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 for handling full versus empty there's other ways of, of doing this that are not too complex and I'll cover them some other time uh, which work both in software and hardware that let the whole queue fill, uh, the whole queue fill up. But um, in, in, in this approach, we basically waste one element of capacity in the queue for the sake of a slightly simpler uh, invariance. All right. Um, so if these are the conditions for full and empty, then um, actually let's move these down here. Then in queue is ready if uh, this thing is not full. And DQ is ready if um, this thing is not empty. So I just uh, move the outputs down, which is convenient, so we don't have to duplicate their definition. Um, now DQ data, which is an output, is going to be um, basically is going to be whatever the um, well, let's see. There, it, it, there may be an off by one bug here if, if we don't think it through. But basically, it's going to be uh, we're going to configure the um, the read port of the memory so that it's always reading from wherever the read address is. I mean, that sounds pretty obvious. Um, and then the DQ data is going to be you know the data result we get back from that read port. Um, and, and I think there. Uh, I think there's a bug here, and I'll get to that in a sec. I think this is going to be off by one, um, potentially. Or, pro or maybe not. But anyway, let's just leave this for now. So, so that kind of makes sense. So in order to serve uh, the DQ, we, uh, we read from this address. And we do that even if the queue is empty. If we're, if the queue is empty, then we just read whatever random value happens to be there, which will be initially zero, but afterwards could be whatever. But um, as long as we're not lying and saying that there's valid data there because it doesn't say, you know, DQ is ready, um, that's fine. Now for the right adder, um, we have the following condition. The address is just going to be whatever a right adder is. Um, the write data is going to be whatever the enqueue data is. Uh, the enable is going to be, well, um, on the one hand, you know, the enqueue enable, but also we have to say, uh, you know, we have to ensure the uh, the enqueue is ready, which which means it's not full. So so this so this conjunction of the enable and the ready signal. Um, is what determines whether we actually proceed with the write to the memory to enqueue the new element. Um, and so that's it in terms of updating uh, the memory, but then we also have to update the cursors. So read adders, how does read adder, uh, how does read adder advance? Um, this advances when the DQ takes place. So if DQ is enabled and DQ is ready, because again we only advance it if you know, but one the 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 client wants to DQ something and the thing is ready to be DQ'd, the queue is ready to be DQ'd, meaning it's not uh, not empty, then we increment read adder. Otherwise, we retain the old value. And keep in mind this has wraparound semantics because of the address type is is adapted to the size of the memory and the size of the queue. Um, and for the right adder next, it's the same deal. Uh, NQ has to be enabled, and it has to be ready. Then it gets incremented. Otherwise, um, 
Otherwise, it retains its old value, something like this. Um, so let's see if that works. I have a hunch there will be some off by one bugs because of the the cycle delay for some of these things being being one out of, of date. In which case, you can do stuff like use the next port rather than uh, the current value. But uh, let, let's try this first and see how it works. Uh, and then we need a test module. Well, actually, we can instantiate this directly. So let's say we have a FIFO of uh, one byte elements, and it's a 64, size 64, but we're never allowed to fill it completely. Um, so it's 63 effective elements. Uh, let's first see if we can get that far. Type object memory has no attribute. Read data. Okay. Interesting. Oh, right. I guess it hasn't been instantiated. Um, when you call this, I think you want to that's interesting. Let me think about that. Well, for now we can just do the do this thing, do an extra invocation. But um, I think you probably want to do everything in one invocation. Um, but that requires you to know which of the arguments belong to the constructor, the parameterized constructor versus the the other stuff. So for now, let's just do it like this. OK, so that compiles. Um, so let's try making a test bench for that. So FIFO test. Um, uh, FIFO test. Let's have two, um, actually. All right, they have to, I want to stub them in um, just to see if we can even get this far before I write the code. Okay, so um, I mean, we can try to put through all possible bytes and make sure they come out on the other side. So um, as a producer, what I have to do is I have to wait until the queue is ready to be in queue to. So I have to say while not in queue ready yield. And then when it is ready, um, I am going to uh, actually, and, and the way this, uh, I should mention this, it's implicit, it doesn't really, really in that case. You, you 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 don't wait to set the enable until you see the queue is ready. You're, you, you set the um, it, you set you set the enable unconditionally as you start to make the request and then you wait for this thing to become ready um, so you set this you spin until the you can enqueue oh and I should set the data I want to enqueue um, which is just I uh, then I spin and then finally, once we're here, I have to do another yield to actually commit the instruction uh, to commit the data because this is just this could execute zero yields if the thing is initially ready, and so this is the thing that actually commits it. Um, and I do that, I guess you can say, until I'm done. Um, so eventually, we're done. 
and we set uh, enqueue enable back to zero. We don't want to enqueue anymore. Um, and if we do this, this thing will actually get stuck at some point, right? Because once the queue fills up, this thing will spin forever. So it needs the producer to dequeue stuff to make progress. Um, and so on the other side, we are going to say basically the same thing, um, kind of in reverse. Uh, we spin while DQ is not ready. And then when it is ready, we assert that um, the DQ data is equal to I. So we're iterating over things in the same order, so it should be consistent. And then we yield, and at this point, the yield has actually commits the DQ. So we can read the data, and then the data is gone the next cycle. It, you know, all the internal state of the FIFO gets updated. So this this has approximately, and let's put this back to zero after we're done. Not that it really matters in this case. This has approximately zero chance of working in the first try, but um, let's try anyway. FIFO object has no queue. Uh, DQ data. It's not so. Okay, I guess I forgot to wrap it in the output constructor. Yep. So DQ data, this should be like that. Okay, this doesn't work. So interestingly, I guess the first one worked, but um, that's, I guess, kind of cheating because um, you know, zero is the default value of everything. So it, you can kind of get that by, by accident almost. Um, Actually, let's let's try seeing over here whether the expected pattern. Um, so here, i is zero. Oh, that's actually spinning. That's curious. NQ ready should be okay. Why wouldn't NQ ready be true the first cycle? Is my question. So initially, read address and write address are zero, and so it's certainly true. I guess it's I can write it like this. Um, certainly true that one is not equal to zero. Did I? That should be true initially. Regardless of what else is true. Okay. So what's going on here with the FIFO? And Q is not ready. I guess the reason it's not ready is you haven't even updated anything for the first cycle. Because oh yeah, I should mention that. All of these get executed before the circuit gets a chance to execute for the first time. So sometimes you have to wait for it to go in from its default values and update. Um, so anyway, let's do it that way. So you can enqueue, and now we do enqueue. At this point, the DQ should not be ready because you haven't updated 
the um, the queue yet, so it's still running on the like on the you know it's still saying the queue is empty, so you can't dequeue something. Um, now this should be round two, and this should we should be allowed to enqueue stuff here. And queue ready, indeed. Um, And now this should be right. So now this thing is no longer empty. And um, DQ is ready. DQ data is zero. Which is, you know, sort of true by default. So it's maybe not the most interesting um, fact. So I think this is where. Um, DQ data is incorrectly set because we're using um, let's maybe do this set it up here <clears throat> um, the address we're reading from the next cycle is going to be out of date by one. So I think what you want to read from is actually read data read adder next, which is whatever it's going to be next cycle. So this is this is a classic kind of off by one cycle issue you run into with synchronous logic where sometimes it's okay for everything to be consistently behind by one cycle, but some of this stuff, actually, I guess one way you can look at it is, um, well, there's there's two ways to do it. One has more latency than the other. This is the less latency version. The problem essentially is that not full, these outputs here are combinational outputs. They're not registered outputs. They say what is currently true about read adder and write adder, but, um, but everything from the memory is delayed by one cycle. So when we're told, it's kind of out of date in that sense. Um, let me see. I think this will work. Even though it will introduce one cycle of latency, it'll be consistent latency. If these are delayed, so these are registered outputs, this means it always takes one cycle to when something actually becomes non-empty or non-full before you see it externally. But it means that the this the delay from this is consistent with the delay from from the memory reads. Um, you you could do it the other way around, and maybe I'll share that in a sec. But let's try this first. Okay, this is, doesn't work. So that wasn't the issue apparently. So we're still getting, we're still getting that. Um, let me peep inside. Do we actually write? So presumably this one is a little hopeful to assume that that one corresponds to the state I'm care I care about. Um, okay, let, let me think through. You're reading from read adder. So the right adder originally points to that. Now the right adder advances. Let me try doing what I was going to do originally.
do think it has to be next because at least when it works like this. So cycle one, the queue is empty. The producer puts something in the queue. The next cycle, um, the dequeuer sees the queue now is, is no longer empty. It dequeues something. At that point, Yeah, I do think you need an output delay, unless you have forwarding from the writer to the reader. So let's try that first of all. I'm also getting, this heat is getting to me, I guess. Let me just take a quick drink. Um, Okay, when the queue goes from non -empty, uh, empty to non-empty, the writer leaves, and actually, to, I should have done this from the beginning. Um, let's say that the value you put here is like this, just, or, just because one is, sorry, zero is two, you can't see anything from zero, basically. Did I fix it? No. Oh god, it all worked. The problem, well in this case I guess it's just a mask thing. Um, Wait, so it didn't work before. Let me try that. Oh, it's the combination of doing the output delay and the next. I guess that makes sense. Okay. So let's see. Q starts out empty. Now it works. Let me just explain to myself and you guys why it works. Initially, the Q is empty. Uh, so the consumer stalls. The producer puts something in there. Next cycle... Um, I guess it still looks empty. Um, we think. The reads are delayed by one cycle. But they're also using a read address that's delayed in turn. Like this represents what it was. So if you're popping, if you're dequeuing, then the next cycle, yeah, no, this just makes sense. In the next cycle, you want to be producing what's the thing after what you popped or dequeued. So, okay, this, so this, I think this is just what you always want, period. Uh, so this this is just what it needs to be basically, because anytime you DQ in the cycle after the DQ, you want to be outputting the next element after the thing you just DQ'd. So this this just has to be the true period. Now for this, um, if you let So after the first cycle, it becomes non empty. It will now say that the write, 
think we tried this before. Yeah, and that doesn't work. Um, All right. How are we doing on time? My brain is clearly too fuzzy to. Well, it's working, uh, and it's roughly what I was expecting to do. But um, I think I need an easier way of thinking about the delays because I don't think this is strictly. Yeah, anyway. So anyway, let, let, let's call it a day for that. We're already at one hour and 45 minutes. Um, so yeah, that's a FIFO implementing using our own register-based memory. And uh, <laughs> once we have real low-level, you know, hard-coded memory support, this will still work on top of those. And um, actually, in the case of FPGAs, they actually have a way of configuring their VRAMs to work as FIFOs as well, which for bigger FIFOs is useful. But one of the nice things about this is it also works for really small FIFOs that you might implement on top of so-called distributed RAMs in Xilinx FPGAs. Um, so something like this is basically a good uh, basic FIFO. Um, probably the main thing you might want to change, although it's not a huge deal, is you can allow the, the, the FIFO to become full, completely full and use its full capacity. It requires, there's a few different tricks you can use to resolve the whole uh, ambiguity between empty uh, and full when that is the case. Um, and maybe I'll talk about that later. All the same tricks you know from hard software basically applies as the short answer. So anyway, I think that's it for today with that stuff. Um, tomorrow I won't do a stream. Uh, Friday I will do a stream again, but tomorrow I'm out all day. So anyway, um, that was the the next thing I wanted to cover: uh, synchronous memories and then FIFOs on top of those. And um, and then I guess off stream I will ponder how I want to implement built-in memories without uh, screwing the code base in terms of the language implementation too much with, with ad hoc junk. So anyway, I'll, I'll cover that next time, hopefully, uh, what I decide to do for that. But th that's it for today. Um, I will see you guys in a few days.